I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 1030, Wednesday, April 28th. This is the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. I'm just really bored by all these derby horses, especially that one coming out of post-12. Uh, hi, I'm Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent with Thoroughbred Daily News. And yes, I got a John Green t-shirt as well. On Sunday, it's going to be available on eBay. If he wins the Derby, $79.99. If he loses the Derby, three for a dollar. Jonathan Green, General Manager for DJ Stable. And I want to thank everyone for their tweets and emails and texts. We're also very excited about running a horse uh, in the Never Win Two Lifetime uh, for sixty-two <laughs> fifty down at Gulfstream. <laughs> That's those are the big Saturday races we all the, we all strive for. For, um, for a long for a long time, those were the Saturday races for DJ Stable. Absolutely. Well, now look at you, John got, and Len. We got merch. We got merch and everything. Merch. Maybe we can get you to sign a program once you're famous. Uh, so, so best of luck to John and, and Len and the whole gang, and, and we'll, we'll we'll talk more about it as the show goes on. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. The flexibility to buy and sell year round, the convenience of an intuitive digital platform, the opportunity to reach a global audience and never leave the farm. No matter your strategy, Keeneland's digital sales ring provides an advantage that's yours for the taking. Backed by the most trusted name in Thoroughbred Sales, find your digital advantage at the Keeneland May Digital Sale. Entries close May 18th. Visit KeenelandDigital.com for details. So we have reached Kentucky Derby Week. Kentucky Derby 147 is this Saturday. We'll break it all down as well as some of the undercard stakes. Uh, But first, here's a rundown of the field, numbers 1 through 20. Number one is Known Agenda. The sixth Florida Derby winner for Todd Fletcher looks to become his third Kentucky Derby winner. No one has won the Derby from the rail draw since Ferdinand in 1986. Number two is Like the King, winner of the Jeff Ruby Stakes over a synthetic track at Turfway. He's the only horse in the field without a win over dirt. Number three is Brooklyn Strong, the blue collar story. Bought for just $5,000 at OBS April, he'll be ridden by Umberto Rispoli, who was taken off of Santa Anita Derby winner, Rock Your World. Number four is Keep Me In Mind, third behind Essential Quality at 30 to one in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile and second behind him at 52 to one in the Breeders' Futurity. He's been unable to factor in two starts as a three-year-old. Number five is Sainthood, aggressively placed by Todd Pletcher off of a troubled trip second in the Jeff Ruiz Stakes. Number six is Obesos, who's produced a new buyer top in all five career starts and was a fast closing third at 28 to one in the Louisiana Derby. Number seven is Mandaloon, a dull sixth in the Louisiana Derby. His Risen Star win got a 98 fire, which is fifth highest in the field. This will be the first time in six starts that he doesn't go favored. Number eight is Medina Spirit, yet to be worse than second in five starts, four of which came in graded stakes and will be piloted by last year's Derby winner, John Velasquez. Number nine is Hot Rod Charlie, who looks to give Doug O'Neill his third Derby win. Second at 94 to 1 to essential quality in the juvenile, he got a 99 buyer for his Louisiana Derby. Number 10 is Midnight Bourbon, one of two for Steve Asmussen, who's still seeking his first Derby win after 21 starters. Midnight Bourbon is a half brother to Grade 1 winner Gervin, who was 13th in the 2017 Derby. Number 11 is Dynamic One, who took four tries to break his maiden, but stepped right into Stakes Company and was a tough luck second in the Wood Memorial. Number 12 is Helium, undefeated in three starts and comes in off an eight-week layoff. His 84 buyer in the Tampa Bay Derby belies a huge effort in which he moved early, was wide around both turns, and battled back to win after being passed in the stretch. Number 13 is Hidden Stash. Second in that Tampa Bay Derby, he also covered a lot of ground, but was the well-beaten fourth in the bluegrass. Number 14 is Essential Quality, a deserving favorite being an undefeated champion, but is no faster on buyer figures than the other contenders. No one has won the Derby from the 14 hole since Carryback in 1961. Good Elfin's best chance yet to win its elusive Derby. Number 15 is Rock Your World, also undefeated after running away to a Santa Anita Derby win in his first dirt start. He picks up Joel Rosario, the hottest rider in the country who won the Derby on Orb in 2013. Number 16 is King Fury, the most expensive horse in the race, selling for $950,000 as a yearling. He's the only horse with multiple wins over the Churchill track. 
Number 17 is highly motivated, who looks to give Chad Brown his first derby win. Breaking from post 17, which is yet to produce a winner and has only three in the money finishes and 42 derby starts. Number 18 is Superstock, co owned by Steve Asmussen's father, Keith. He was third to the favorite in the Breeders' Futurity and won the Arkansas Derby last out. Number 19 is Soup and Sandwich, one of two horses from Mark Cassie, who is also looking for his first derby. And number 20 is Bourbonic, who upset the wood at 72 to 1 and is the first derby mount for Kendrick Carmouche, who is the first black jockey to ride in the derby since 2013. So this is obviously not the Derby field that we expected earlier in the year. I, I, I saw a really interesting stat that um, both from pool one, the Kentucky Derby future pool one and pool four, which is the last pool, only seven horses made it to the Derby. That's incredible. Seven horses from pool one, seven horses from pool four total, not 14 together. Seven horses from pool four made it to the Derby. And we saw that a little bit last week. Um, we didn't talk about it because we were on scene at OBS. Um, but, you know, there were a couple of horses dropping off and, and a couple of horses that you didn't think were going to get in that were down around 26 or 27 are going to going to get into the into the field. Um, overall, it's a very, very competitive race. Obviously, life is good. Falling off the Derby Trail was the biggest factor in that he was going to be a heavy, heavy favorite. But now essential quality, I think, might take over that mantle. And especially with the news yesterday that um, or two days ago that Mattress Mac is going to be placing a big old derby bet on essential quality. So I think that that might give people value otherwise that they wouldn't have otherwise had. Mattress Mac is doing this as he usually does as a hedge for his promotion and his furniture store where people get their get money back for their mattresses of essential quality uh, wins. So he's hedging there. Um, but, you know, in terms of, of the actual field, I, you know, if you look at the buyer figures, essential quality does not stand out whatsoever. If you look at the sheet numbers, He's a little bit better, and I, I think more of a deserving favorite. But I don't know on the on the buyer scale. He's he, he's only he's run five times. Obviously, won all five times. His top is a ninety-seven, and there are several horses in here who have run ninety-eights and ninety-nines. Uh, Rock Your World won a, run, ran a one hundred in the Santa Anita Derby. He's the only horse of the triple digit buyer in the field. Um, I guess it 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 depends on you know how much you trust his form in terms of finding a way to get it done every single race. He hasn't run this blowout monster race that really makes you afraid, but he has been able to get it done. And as I've said before, his versatility is his biggest asset. Drew well, the 14 hall, even though, you know, the post hasn't won the Derby since 1961. I think most people would agree that that's a good draw. You want a few more horses to your inside than outside. It's a long run of the first turn. He's got good tactical speed. I am. I, I, I'm, Kind of, I'm not trying to beat him, but you know, I also think that he's going to be a little bit vulnerable at a short price in terms of horses to, uh, to bet against him. I do like helium. I got to say, I'm not just sucking up to John here. Um, and I've, I've moved past the point where I need to suck up to John. Um, helium, I think he's 50 to one in the morning line. I don't think he's going to be quite that high. But if you look at his sheet numbers, you know, essential quality ran like a half or a negative half in a couple of his last races. Everybody else is in between like a two and a three on their top race. And Helium ran a three in the Tampa Bay Derby. So he's right there. Dynamic one is another one that I think makes a lot of sense. He's kind of the now horse, I think. He took four tries to break his maiden, but then he ran that big race in the Wood Memorial. He came back with a super, super work at Churchill for a horse who doesn't usually work that fast. Uh, Hot Rod Charlie and Mandaloon and Obesos, I think, can all factor. I think we talked about this a little bit. The Louisiana horses are probably the strongest as a whole of any of the, the prep uh, locations. So those are the three that I would be interested in at a little bit of prices. Uh, Hot Rod Charlie, not probably not going to be a price. No agenda is a total toss out for me. You know, we're going to talk to Randy Moss in a little bit. Um, but he, 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 I think he thinks that, that, uh, post positions are a little overrated, but that one hole, man, you just have to have, you have to be, you have to gun, you have to gun from that rail draw. Otherwise you're going to get shuffled back. You're going to get checked going into that cavalry charge into the first turn. That's the only post that to me is, is kind of a throw out one and two, because it's just, you, you have to be race ridden early on. You can't really just settle like you can if you have a post that's further outside. So those are my initial thoughts. We'll circle back to me and with a couple more, but let's toss it to Bill and John and see what their impressions are. Yeah, Joe, I mean, looking at the same sort of uh, the races and overview, uh, in the last, what, six, seven, eight years, the Derby has turned into a very formidable race. Uh, I mean, Country House is a big price, but he doesn't really count because he got put up. The, uh, the favorites have won a lot. 
And you're not getting any wacky outcomes like mine that bird. But I got a feeling this is going to be a wacky Kentucky Derby in the sense that, I mean, I see the same things that you, you see. Can a, a, can a central quality win? Of course he can. But, you know, he's the favorite and he's vulnerable because, as you said, he has not shown that he's a superior talent to everybody else in the field. And also, I, too, looked at the thoroughbred sheets, and there are about half a dozen horses that are going to be in that 30, 40 to 1 neighborhood, helium among them, that are fast enough to be competitive with this field. So from a gambling aspect, I think I would look at it just trying to be the central quality, throwing some other horses in top, and then, you know, try to, you know, I'm not saying what to happen, but could this be one of those races where the super fact is going to pay $79,000 when obesos finishes second and helium is third and something like that. It, it's it's all, po- uh, all possible. We're going to talk later with Randy Moss, and I, I did ask him this question about what he thinks of this crop overall, and you can wait for, for his answer that's coming up. But I think this is not a good group. Uh, and I'm not one of those guys, that, some people say that every single year, this crop stinks, this crop stinks, this crop stinks. I don't. But if you just, you know, we all are so into the numbers now. If you look at the numbers of these horses, and as you mentioned, um, Rocky World's the only one with a triple-digit buyer, they're really not all that fast, these horses. So, uh, you know, it should be a good race. The Godolphin angle is a good story. Then I'm trying to finally win the Kentucky Derby. But I was sort of thinking that it's going to be, when they cross the wire on Saturday, we're all going to be scratch- scratching our heads saying, how did he win? Yeah, and Bill, just to piggyback on what you were saying, you know, it, it really has been – uh, a chalky derby the past couple of years. You have, uh, you know, Authentic and Tis the Law finished one, two last year. Justify, you know, one in, in 18 is the favorite, always dreaming. Uh, you know, in 17 was five to one. Nyquist was a two to one favorite in 16. American Pharaoh was two to one favorite. California Chrome, two to one favorite. So, you know, it, it, it has come up recently as a very chalk centric kind of race. Um, this year, though, I think that you can make a case for a number of horses. Um, I think that even though uh, essential quality is the champion two-year-old and is undefeated. Um, he, it may have taken some of the starch out of him, you know, last time out when, when he ran in the bluegrass, uh, he had to really fight and dig to win the connections say that was a good thing because it showed that he had some grit and, and, you know, and, and it wasn't easy for him. Um, other people look at it and say, you know, is he setting up for a bounce because of that? Because he really did have to have a huge effort in order to, uh, to win that kind of a race. Um, when I, when I personally look at a race like this, where there's 19, 20 horses in it, um, I circle back and look at horses that I don't think are going to win. And there's, you know, six or seven horses in this race where it would take, a really a lot for them to win, um, ranging from horses that are trying to, to improve on the dirt um, versus, you know, on, on the poly before um, horses that have run a number of times, almost danced every dance, um, you know, like uh, like a hidden stash where, you know, he, he's run seven times and, and really every prep he's had to run hard um, to hit the board. So, you know, is that, is that too many is the, is the juice out of the, you know, out of the lemon on, on that front. Um, then you also have horses that, that you have a question mark next to him. Man- Mandaloon is probably the biggest question mark horse in this race because he looked like he was going to be one of the favorites going to the Derby. And he just put in such a lackluster race in the Louisiana Derby. Do you say, okay, he peaked and, and that's it for him. Or do you just cross a line through it? And if you cross a line through that race, um, you know, I think he could be, you know, very easily one of the top two or three horses in, in this race. So I look at a race like this and cross off horses and then work backwards and say, OK, of the remaining dozen or so, which ones are, you know, are, are really peaking for this kind of a race. Um, and I agree with 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 both of your sentiments. And that's why we're running in this race, because we're not scared of the favorite. Would I be surprised if essential quality wins? No, he is, you know, undefeated in the chan- two year old champ until proven otherwise he's the horse to beat. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, a 20 to one shot, 30 to one shot ended up winning this race. And then you look back on it and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense, because fill in the blank was peaking. Fill in the blank, you know, had an excuse last time out. Fill in the blank, uh, you know, got a better post this time and 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 was able to sit off the pace or was actually the only speed in the race and, and nobody could catch him. So I think we're going to be looking at this race at, at 7.15 on Saturday night and, and kind of going, yeah, that makes sense, rather than where the hell did this horse come in from? John will be drunk off of pure leaf ice teas by that point. So we're, we're not, we're not going to get any coherent thoughts from him. Um, but no, I mean, I agree with your point that I don't, I don't, I don't know. There aren't like a ton of, of tosses. I'll give you my tosses so that you can throw it back in my face when one of these horses wins. tossing like, like the King um, tossing, keep me in mind, tossing Saint hood, 
I mean, that's there really aren't that many beyond that. Hidden stash, I guess I can toss uh, uh, soup and sandwich for Bonic. Like, that's only five or six horses that, like, I don't see it as win contenders. You know, I think that leaves 14 or 15 horses that I could conceivably make a case for. That's usually the kind of race that I stay away from and don't bet because when it's, you know, when, when you have that many conceivable outcomes, it's kind of just like, you know, pulling a slot lever or, or playing lottery. Uh, the interesting thing is, is the pace as well is, you know, the scratch of Cattle River, Cattle River's defection was a big deal in terms of the pace. I, th- I thought he was going to inject a lot of speed into the race. Now I look at three different horses that I think might be able to, to go to the front. Obviously, Rock Your World is going to be aggressively handled because uh, he went wire to wire in the Santa Anita Derby. He went fast early in that race and kept going. So he's he's proven that. Uh, Soup and Sandwich, who was, who was up on the pace in the Florida Derby from an outside draw, you got to think Tyler Gaffion is going to be aggressive on him. And Medina Spirit, who has set some, who has run some fast fractions in his career, I think has to has to go from inside of the other two speeds. Other than that, like I don't see anyone that's really hell bent on the lead, and I the, I think that there's going to be a moderate pace. We're going to talk a little bit about the Oaks in, in a few, where the Oaks looks like it has no speed whatsoever, at least to me. Um, but you know th- that leads to an interesting scenario where there's a lot of tactical decisions to be made going into that first turn, unless somebody just runs off. I think, you know, a lot of guys are going to have to maybe use a little bit more speed from their horses than they normally normally would, including Helium, because he, he's not slow. Um, he's been up on the pace before going seven furlongs. Uh, so I, I think, you know, Julian might want to be a little bit aggressive there. Don't know what your guys' plans are. Um, but any thoughts on how you, how you guys see the race shaping up? Do you agree that this might be a bit of a slower pace or do you think that someone's going to take the bull by the horns here? Um, I think it's going to be the former, Joe, because, you know, there are horses that have tactical speed, but having tactical speed versus, you know, have to have the lead types is a very different thing. So, you know, I rock the world, rock the world uh, is probably the good uh, guess to see who's going to go to the lead, but I can't see them going, you know, 45 to the half. There's just no horse in this race that wants to do that. Now, the only way that will change would be if, you know, three riders all have the same idea. There's not much speed in here. I'm going to go for the lead. And they all get up uh, and, and battle into a pace thing. So I don't think um, the winner necessarily has to be a front runner. But if you have, if you like somebody and you know they're going to be 16th, 17th early, I would be a little wary of that horse, uh, especially maybe you want to put him in third or fourth in the, in the tries and supers or something like that. But I would definitely be a little hesitant to, you know, make the pick of that nature. But it's, it's one of the riddles that makes this race interesting. I mean, usually in the Kentucky Derby, we absolutely know who's going to go to the lead. And, you know, if it's going to be a fast pace or a slow pace, I can't recall too many derbies like this where, you know, nobody really knows. It, it's really, uh, you know, I wish I could bet this race a half mile into it. I bet fair you could, but um, th- that that would make it a lot easier to play, right? And, and and you would also think that on the outside, you know, soup and sandwich has to go, um, has to send, has to be close to the lead, and, and I think you can make a case also the highly motivated is also going to be on or close to the lead, you know, from the seventeen um, post as, as well. Um, that being said, and and I'm going to shift gears on you guys for for a minute. That that it's something we don't usually talk about that often, um, but that's a horse's temperament. And when you get through some of these races, um, you know, that, that especially in, in, in this day and age of COVID where there aren't fans or aren't that many fans, um, horses' mentalities, you know, aren't really a big part of the equation. But in watching some of the coverage for this week of, of horses being, you know, schooled in the paddock and, and how, they're, how they're doing in the morning, um, there are a couple of horses here that I would be concerned about if I was a handicapper, um, especially when there's going to be fans coming in and, and also they get a sense of like the pressure that 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 the people are are you know um, facilitating you know and, and the nervousness that they have. Um, Midnight Bourbon, who is a horse that I I really like and has some good numbers and and is breezing very well at Churchill, gets really hot in the paddock and acts up in the paddock, and that would be a concern of mine. Asking a horse to go a mile and a quarter um, is are they expending additional energies you know pre race, and that's a horse that you know, that, that certainly has good numbers. And, and I certainly wouldn't bet against normally um, the Mike Smith, uh, Steve S. Mewson, you know, combination, but that's a horse that I 
would be concerned about if I saw him getting washy in the paddock, I would, um, you know, knock him down a couple of pegs in, in, in my mind. And then soup and sandwich also, you know, where, again, this is a catchy trained horse and Mark obviously trains horses for us. Um, so I'm not giving away any inside information that the general public has, but that's a horse that last race was like trying to mount the pony. I mean, he was all over the place physically and and acting like a tappet and you know tappets in in general um usually you know have that quick turn of foot and and energetic and are high twitch kind of horses he's out of a tappet mare and he is showing a lot of those same mental attributes um as well about being a little high strung and and not having his mind on business so again if you're looking I think in this kind of a race, you're splitting hairs to kind of get rid of horses out of out of your exactto or trifecta box. Those would be two horses that I'd be watching in the post parade. And and if they were acting up or they were expending a lot more energy than than the other horses, you know, were I would be concerned. Would I cross them off altogether? I don't know. But in the hierarchy of things, maybe I wouldn't put them in my you know three horse exacta box or my five horse trifecta box if they were getting washy and and expending energy because so many of these horses are like a flat foot tie right now that you're looking for any little thing that, that, that would be, you know, throw them off their game, whether it's, you know, being in the one hole for known agenda or physically just, you know, throwing off too much energy in the, in the pre-race um, and, and not having enough gas in the tank, you know, come to the top of the stretch. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's going to be, it's going to be great to have fans back. We saw, I saw a smattering of fans out there yesterday for the beginning of Derby week. So that's huge. And it's, it really does feel like back to normal for Saturday in May, fans in the stands you know obviously it's not going to be full capacity but we're we're thankful to see that um yeah and I, th- I agree with john that you know the field is so evenly matched that i think the walkover to the first turn run is gonna make or break a lot of horses in this race whether or not they, they keep their stuff together walking over and in the paddock being saddled and then whether or not they can avoid trouble going into the the first turn they can break well i think that you know like bill said if we can bet the race a quarter mile or a half mile into it, I'd have a much better idea than I currently do. But that's what makes the Derby so interesting and and, and so fascinating and, and, and such a puzzle is that, you know, especially with a field like this where you don't necessarily have a chunk of clear top contenders above everybody else is that there are so many variables and, you know, it, it, it keeps the suspense, the suspense up all the way through uh, that, you know, there's no, there's no procession of, of like an expected favorite that, you know, you, you know, is either going to going to win or run second. I thought last year, you know, it was kind of an anticlimactic derby, honestly, um, with Tizzle and, and authentic. It was a decent little stretch battle, but it's felt like, you know, there were, there they were very few top contenders in that race. And two of them actually were the only ones that really ran in that race. So, um, and this year, I, it's going to be more of a of a scramble, which we, which is is good for for you know betting the race, and it's it's good for TV. It's 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 more interesting to have more possible winners, and that's what we've got this year. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll we'll give our top three picks each for the Derby. Now these are not legally binding. I'm not obligated to bet these horses. If one of them wins, don't automatically assume that I made money on it because I know how to, you know, finagle my way out of out of wins uh, betting the Derby. Um, but so, so for the top three, I'm going to go Obesos number one. I know that's a little bit of a, of a long shot. Um, I'm hoping that he shows a little bit more speed because I don't think the race, the, the pace is going to be that fast. But I just think he's going to have good value, and I like those Louisiana horses. Number two, I'm going to go Dynamic One. Like I said, I think he's the now horse. You know, I think again he's going to be a really good price, and he's yeah, I, I think he's got a lot. He's got a lot more potential to find, I think, than most of these horses. And number three, I got to go Helium. And again, it's not just because John's here. I do think that he's going to provide good value, especially if you're a Sheets player. Um, hopefully, he can he can work out a decent trip. So I'm going all three long shots. One, two, three, Obesos, Dynamic One, and Helium. Bill? Yeah, I'm going to go with Highly Motivated on top. And, you know, I've always been an essential quality fan, so why am I not picking him after he beat Highly Motivated in the Bluegrass? Uh, because he only beat him by a neck, and you're going to get a much better price on Highly Motivated. And, you know, the, the winner of this race is going to run the best race of their lives. 
They're going to improve five, six lengths over anything they've ever done before. They almost have to. And here's a horse trained by Chad Brown that I think has not reached his peak yet. And these horses are so lightly raced this year that you can probably say that about a lot of them. So, And also he's got tactical speed, which I, I think is going to help. So then I would put essential quality second because I think the bluegrass is going to be the key race. And then um, I'm with you, Joe. I like that uh, dynamic one a little bit as well for Todd Fletcher. He's the one that I'm going to throw in my ticket at 25 to 1 or so. Very nice. Very nice. I'm going to go uh, a, a little bit different than what you guys are. And again, we've been talking about there's 20 horses in here and there's probably a dozen horses you can choose from. Um, and, and I would go with Hot Rod Charlie. And Hot Rod Charlie just has been impressive um, all throughout his career. He surprised everyone by running, you know, second in the in the Breeders' Cup at 99 to one. Basically, um, he came back and ran a hard fought, you know, race in the in the Lewis out in, in Santa Anita. Then they shipped him to the fairgrounds, and he ran a really good race, um, you know, in, in the fairgrounds, um, albeit with a different trainer. Um, but but now he's back in the barn of, of Doug O'Neill's. And uh, I just feel like that that horse is really rounding in the shape. He's a half to Matoli. And, and uh, I feel like that, uh, that, that he's really rounding in the form. Um, so I would go with Hot Rod Charlie first. Mandaloon, I'm going to go with second. I'm just going to put a line, blindly put a line through the Louisiana Derby and just say that, uh, you know, it was just a, a bad race all around and that Brad Cox is going to figure him out and uh, and get him back on on the right path. Um, he's impeccably bred and into mischief out of an empire maker mare. Um, it'd be a great story if Judd Mont, you know, ran well in the in the Derby. And uh, I think he's still going to be 15, 20 to one in this race, which would be you know really good odds, um, you know, to, to bet on it at, at that point. And then even though I didn't pick him for our contest and even though I didn't pick him, uh, you know, all throughout, I would be remiss if I didn't pick my own damn horse for the, you know, to hit the board in the Derby. I got to go with helium. Um, you know, again, he's going to be 30, 40 to one. Uh, but I appreciate, you know, Joe, what you're saying as far as in the sheet numbers, how it looks, I think that, uh, it, there's going to be a lot of inconsistency on the front end and, and, you know, horses, the, the jockeys are going to be jockeying for position and, and not really knowing, and it may be three or four horses wide, um, you know, throughout the first turn until things kind of settle in. Um, we have, uh, you know, a, a good racing style. We can sit off it. We can, you know, come from behind. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, again, he'll run the race of his life and and be there at the top of the stretch. Um, but I think this is a wide open race. And I think it's a wide open race because literally anybody can uh, can win it because there are no superstars, uh, you know, right now, in, in my humble opinion. Agreed. Uh, Mandolin would be the fourth horse. If I could pick a fourth horse, I'm definitely interested in him as well. He's worked well over the track. I uh, don't like drawing lines through horses races with no excuse, but nevertheless, another good price that I, I think can factor in. Uh, before we wrap up the, dis the derby discussion, I just wanted to throw up the uh, the standings for our, our derby chase three-year-old uh, contest. I am officially eliminated because I've managed to get zero horses um, in the starting gate. I thought, I thought Caddo River would give me that, that one last chance, but not so. Uh, the rest of you guys are all doing pretty well. John has two, he's got Midnight Bourbon and Highly Motivated. Bill has three. My money's on Bill. He's got the favorite essential quality. He's also got Medina Spirit and Keep Me in Mind. Um, Al's got Mandaloon and Hot Rod Charlie. And uh, Brian has Hidden Stash um, as, as greatest honor and concert tour. Both will not make the Derby. Those are his two big contenders. Um, so best of luck to you guys and best of luck to John, obviously, in the Derby. Uh, we got some more racing to talk about, but we'll break it all down next week on the Writer's Room. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. And this is hard work. It's the hours put in before dawn and after dark. It's the sacrifice, the sweat, the failure, and the faith. This is our industry. This is our life's work. Owning multiple graded stakes winning racehorses like Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and your chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. All right, so we, we, we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on all of the other blockbuster action that's going on this weekend. Obviously, the Kentucky Oaks is on Friday. We've got a bunch of grade ones and grade twos over the weekend at Churchill. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Oaks, and then I'll, I'll just run down some of the big names that are in the, the undercard stakes. 
you know, I, my one thing I was struck by about the Oaks is I think it looks much more formful and chalky than the Derby. Whereas with the Derby, you can you can make a case for 14, 15 different horses winning the race. I don't know that you can make a case for more than like four or five horses realistically winning the Oaks. I think the favorites are all imposing. I think travel column, Malathot and, uh, and search results all have big, big shots, you know, Malathot and search results kind of drew outside a little bit, but I think, I think they'll be okay. I think they have enough tactical speed to stick around and drop in um, heading into that, 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 clubhouse turn uh the horse that i'm interested in the most and i said this after the ashland has passed the champagne now she's 15 to 1 on the morning line i don't think i'm going to get that big of a price probably be in the 8 to 10 to 1 range she was only beaten ahead by malathot in the in the ashland and i just think she's come a long way in a short amount of time some people might say that that would lead to a bounce but i just i think for a lightly raced horse like this i think she's still developing she ran a great race in the ashland Mal- malathot obviously ran terrific to run her down in, in that slow pace uh but i just i think she's got more forward to go and the main thing i see about with the oaks is the lack of pace in the race and that is, is even more exacerbated by the scratch of Ava's grace. Now Ava's grace set the pace in the fantasy and she looked like the only real clear front runner in the race. And she's not going to make it. She didn't pass the vet supposedly. Um, so she's going to scratch. And I think that 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 sets things up better for a horse like past the champagne, who's got speed, who's stretching out a little bit. Um, I think that, you know, she needs to be aggressively ridden in that case, but also search results from the outside is probably going to be in a good pressing position. I just, you know, I, it, it leads me to kind of move away from horses like Clary air, who I think are more of that one run closing type that I just don't feel like they're going to get that kind of set up in this race. But overall, I think it's, it's, it's relatively chalky. I think the three favorites are all legitimate and are all going to get pretty good trips up and and up on a moderate pace or just in behind a moderate pace past the champagne is the horse I'm interested in. Other than that, no, like I said, pretty formful looking. Any thoughts on the Oaks from you guys? Yeah, Joe, I agree with almost everything you said. I also don't think this is a stellar group. I also think this race is going to be pretty formful uh, because the top couple contenders look to be better than everybody else. Um, I'm not excited from a betting standpoint for this race oh, whatsoever. I mean, the Derby is an absolutely phenomenal betting race, and this one isn't. But the one thing that I would say, and it's, you know, I'm picking the chalk here, but there's something very different about Malathat that we haven't seen before. Only one prep. Do you remember they got a little bit of a late start with her? And so she runs in the one prep and gets the job done. You would have to think she's going to improve off that race with Pletcher knowing he wants to get her into the Kentucky Oaks, saving something, and it would be in her first start of the year. So if you like Malathat off of form, I think you can fairly say that she's going to run better this time. So she's the favorite. I think she's going to run better. Boring pick, but there you go. Yeah, and just to add to the snooze fest, um, you know, Joe, I agree with you as far as past the champagne, not only because of the race she put in um, and also the fact that that she could go, you know, gate to wire, um, but also they're calling for all kinds of rain Thursday into Friday. And if the race comes up sloppy, even though past the champagne hasn't run in the mud yet, um, flatters just by genetics really, really do well in the in the slop. Um, so that's only going to help her, you know, that much more, especially being that she's a front running horse, um, isn't going to get a lot of mud in, in her face. And I think that's going to embolden her and, and, and make her, um, you know, even, an even better pick. I hope you get double digits on her because, um, she would actually be a, a very, very good horse to, to bet. Um, especially with the, with, uh, Ava's grace being out and, uh, and some of the other speed defections, um, Malathat, I mean, you know, look, how can you bet against her, uh, you know, especially based on her form and and being undefeated and coming off a four month layoff and and running as well as she did. Um, you know, she also, you know, comes from an AP Indy lined family. So you would think that the slop wouldn't bother her um, at all. And, uh, and, and, you know, the other flatter in the race that I would talk about is search results, Chad Brown's, uh, you know, Philly, who also is undefeated and, and could make a case, you know, for, uh, you know, for running in the slop. So not an exciting race from a betting standpoint, um, but I think that it's, it's going to be an exciting race because on form, there's a couple of horses that, that we've talked about that are kind of above the rest of the field, um, and they should pretty much hit the board in, in my estimation. Yeah, we could we could have a decent stretch battle between between the favorites in there, but you know, it's like not not a race that I'm looking to get too too clever in, other than pass the champagne. Um, just to run down some of the other stuff, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with Friday's races and 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 then move on to Saturday. Uh, Friday we also have the Grade One La Troyenne, 
not a stellar field. She dares the devils in there. She's kind of the most interesting horse. Uh, Max Fields in the Ali Sheba. Uh, you've got a big field in the, in the eight bells. Uh, no, no real superstars in there, but we got a 12 horse field. Day out of the office is returning in that race. So that's, that's the interesting name. I think um, in the eight bells, she's been working lights out. She was unable to make the, the Oaks got a little bit of a late start this year, but uh, interesting that they're cutting her back to, to seven furlongs for that race. So I'll, I'll keep my eye on her uh, in the, the turf sprint on Friday at Churchill Faya who is a really, really interesting horse um, is going to run in there. Probably some, some other speed uh, that, that might put a wrench in his plans, but he's definitely the, the horse I think with the most upside in that race. To me, the most interesting horse that's running on Friday, the most interesting race on Friday is Ann Pearl in the Edgewood. Now she had these, those three monster races as a two-year-old. Uh, she was undefeated. She had a huge race in the, in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf. Um, she hasn't been seen yet as, as a, as a three-year-old, she seems to be loose on the lead in that race or going to mile on a 16. So I'm not going to bet against her at a short price, but I will give a big pop to gift list who I think, you know, if someone does put pressure on Ann Pearl, she is a very, very nice filly. She's a daughter of bated breath, um, for the Ammermans and, and Brian Lynch. Uh, she ran second in the Appalachian and the Appalachian at, Keeneland and close into a really, really slow pace that we talked about after the, after the race, how I wanted, I liked all the top three horses in that race. Jouster got away with this easy pace and giftless made up a lot of ground had to be coming home in 22 and some, a little bit of change. So I, I, while I respect Aunt Pearl, it is her first start off the layoff. If she comes up a little wanting late in deep stretch, I think giftless lift is a list is a very serious three-year-old turf filly um moving on to saturday obviously the, the the derby is the main event but the the turf classic has some interesting horses in it it's a nine horse field um we've got colonel liam who i think you know is kind of the consensus number one older male turf horse right now uh but there's some definitely uh you know roadblocks in his way to try to get this grade one win Ivar who won the Shadwell turf mile last year and a big performance um, is in that race, uh, digital age, smooth, like straight domestic spending, who we last saw winning the Hollywood Derby for Chad Brown, uh, ride a comet for, for Mark Cassie, who was second in the makers, Mark makers, Mark mile last time. So nine horse field, pretty interesting. The biggest star to run on Saturday outside of maybe the Derby winner, if there's an explosive Derby winner, is Gamine. Gamine's going to run in the Derby City Distaff. She's going to be, she looks like the lock of all locks. She's going to be one to five, one to nine, but she's just, there's no other speed in the race. There's no, there's no real big contender that you would be wary of. Bell's the one is in there. She's a grade one winner, but she's kind of a horse that, that needs a little bit of a setup. And Gamine's just supposed to, go out to the front and gallop in that race. And, and we're all looking forward to seeing her run in the Churchill downstakes, you know, owing to the, the topsy turviness of the male sprint division, we got 13 horses in the Churchill downstakes, which is a grade one. Now, uh, nobody that really jumps off the page at you, but tap it to win is a horse that I brought up when he had his four-year-old debut earlier this year at Tampa. He's the horse I would be most interested in just taking a first glance at that race, but another big field. Um, we've got the Churchill distaff turf mile, uh, seven horses, including God Stormy. Um, and then the Pat Day mile is some horses are turning back from the from the Derby Trail to run in that race. Look, Jackie's Warriors in there. Prevalence is also in there. Um, Dream Shake is in there. So those are obviously three horses you've had Derby expectations and dreams at some point, um, but are going to cut back to that, that one mile race. Uh, and then the American Turf is another race with a big field, 14 horses in there. No real superstars, but definitely some big fields, some competitive fields and some big names running throughout the weekend. So I think it's a nice, it's a nice little mix of undercard races where you got some big favorites who everybody's looking to see from a fan standpoint. And then you got some races without those big names that are going to be 13, 14 horse really good wide open betting affairs. So it's going to be a terrific weekend of racing. We're going to break it all down next week. We're obviously looking forward most to the Derby, but there's just so much to be excited about. And it's like I said, it's going to be great to have fans back in the stands at Churchill. Uh, NBC does a great job broadcasting. it. Like I said, we, we spoke to, to Randy Moss, he and Mike Tarico and Jerry Bailey do a great job. So tune in Friday and Saturday. I'll be watching. It's, it's going to be a great, great weekend of racing. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. 
fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. This week's TDN Story of the Week is brought to you by the Minnesota Racehorse Engagement Project. Find out how you can get involved in racehorse ownership at Canterbury Park this summer with several options and investments ranging from $250 to $10,000. Visit racehorseminnesota.com to learn more. All right, so we just wanted to mention a horse real quick who is, is kind of blowing up off of, off of one race and is hopefully going to be heard from a lot the rest of the year, and that's Flightline. Flightline debuted at, at San Anito on Saturday, was bet universally like a good thing, Was went off at, at four to five, I believe, and just was incredible. Won by 13 and a half lengths, geared down. This is a million-dollar horse. Um, was co-owned by, by Costa Hironis and Hironis Racing, who Bill talked to the other day for a story. He got a 105 buyer, which, you know, if you put him in the derby tomorrow to, on Saturday – He'd be favorite. Like, I'm pretty sure he would go off as the favorite. Maybe, maybe send second choice to essential quality, but he'd be right there. And that that you know that speaks to the the kind of murkiness of the Derby field and how there aren't really any of these breakout contenders. But it also speaks to how impressive Flightline was. And he just and he did it all on his own too, which was just incredible to watch. John Sadler trainee. Um, I they seemed to be a little bit non-committal and did not want to commit to running him in any of the triple crown races. Sounds like from the story that Bill did, they're, they're going to point more to the summer and fall. So a little bit disappointing. I would like to see him take a crack at the Preakness and the Belmont, um, especially if the fields are coming up short and, and a little uh, subpar. But nevertheless, whenever we get to see him, if he sticks around, he is potentially a very, very special horse. You just don't win like that with a 105 buyer very often. Like the last debut performance that I can remember that was like that, you know, all things considered with all the hype and the, 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 the win was justify, like justify was the last horse I remember who everybody knew was supposedly really, really good. And then just came out and proved it without a shadow of a doubt in his first race. Obviously he went on to do big things and win the triple crown. We don't know what the future holds for flight line yet, but wow. Just that's, that's all I got to say is wow. And uh, Bill did his story. So I'll toss it to him. Well, I mean, I'll take it one step further, Joe. And, you know, I don't want to get, be guilty of hyping something, hyperbole, overstating it. But I'm going to say this. This is the most impressive debut win from a horse I've ever seen. Um, and, you know, that includes thousands and thousands of horses. For the reasons that, that you said, not only does he demolish the field, but he's literally, you know, in a canter crossing the wire where he's pulled up the 16th ball. Uh, the figure to 105 is just tremendous. Like you said, you know, uh, he is faster than, than any of the horse. You know, you can't take a six for all maiden number compared to a mile and a quarter. But if you want to, he is faster in quite a bit uh, than anybody in the race. The disappointment is that they didn't get him around in time. If he would debut like January or something, think of all the, uh, you know, hype and the craziness. They would have made this horse three to five in the Derby Future Wager if they made life as good two to one. Uh, but, you know, John Sadler is a very good trainer. He's not going to do something that, uh, you know, just, just for the sake of making the Derby. They took their time with this horse, and uh, they have not said one word about where he'll run next. I would imagine whatever allowance race is in the book at Santa Anita uh, coming up next, or non or two other than, will be the spot where he's going to show up. But, yeah, I mean, this is I, – I mean, somebody told me, you got to go watch this. And I was like, yeah, yeah, what's the big deal? Then I watched this, and oh, my God. I, I mean, it was just – Phenomenal. Another horse that that, um, that that might be put in that category of debut first timers that were really, really good. Uncle Mo is another one. But um, Justify, that's a good one to come up with. But uh, I can't, like I said, I, it's the most impressive race I've ever seen from a first time starter. Yeah, I wouldn't want to run against him uh, anytime in the near future based on that race. But but and it was super impressive. We got to pump the brakes a little bit, though. It was only six furlongs and it was on a speed favoring racetrack in Santa Anita. Um, you know, when most of the top horses in Santa Anita are, are headed, you know, east now for, for these big races. But very impressive. 108 and change. 
um, first time out, you know, a, a son of Tappet, a million dollar horse um, at public auction. I mean, checks all the boxes for looks, pedigree, and and obviously the eye test, the way he ran, and and also the 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 uh, you know the the buyer numbers and and all the other metrics that that go out there. Very very impressive, albeit six furlongs. But next time out will be you know another test for him to see if he can possibly go at least a mile or maybe two turns, um, and then we'll see you know where he stands up against you know some of these other seasoned horses. But very impressive race, really su- I mean. Any of us would want to own a horse like that, no question. And actually, Joe almost bid on a horse like that the other day. Well, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, I, I should be so lucky, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you don't want to extrapolate too much from just that that one sprint debut. But man, he, he if he can stay together and, and stretch out, I think he's got a chance to be something really special. Especially if he's going to be beaten up on horses who have been through the rigors of the Triple Crown series. I mean, he's they're going to be ripe for the pickings for a horse. Who's that good? I got another one for you, Bill. How about McLean's music? McLean's music had that one debut race where he ran a 114 buyer. That's the, that's the only other one I can think of other than justify that was, that was, you know, at that level. Um, one other horse I wanted to mention uh, just before we, we move on um, from this past weekend, it's actually yesterday. It was, it was on a Tuesday at parts. And I think I may have found the challenger to Gamine in the Philly and Maris sprint division. And it's a Pennsylvania bred by Hey Chubb. Shout out to Hey Chubb, who's still doing it out here. He's, 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 he's producing state bred steak sources. Usually they're New Jersey breads. This one's a Pennsylvania bread, but they ran the state bred uh, unique Bella steaks at parks yesterday. Now, Chubb Wagon had gone four for four going into that race. She won all of her races by open lengths. She got a 99 buyer, two back at Aqueduct, and had her first stakes race yesterday. Um, it's her first time going seven furlongs, and she shook off some real intense early pace pressure and just blew them away in the stretch and finished full of run perfect on her lead changes one by seven and a half lengths. I don't have a buyer figure for it yet, but I'm guessing it's going to be triple digits or at least very close. And I think, you know, it's going to be David versus versus Goliath, but I think the horse is trained by Guadalupe Preciado owned by Daniel Lopez and George Chestnut. I think we might have a, a, a real matchup for Gamine later in the year. Obviously it's a big step up from unique Bella from the Unique Bella, the Pennsylvania bred Unique Bella, especially when Gavin's going to win by 20 this this weekend. But I'm telling you, man, I found something in this Parks horse. John's shaking his head as the number one fan club, as the number one fan of, of Gavin. But yeah, I'm digging. I'm out here. I'm out here watching Parks on a Tuesday to find you the latest contenders for this 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 coveted crown of Gavin's. We'll see. <laughs> Don't make any T-shirts yet for Chub Wagon. I'll just say that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back after this message from the Minnesota Racehorse Engagement Project. Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week this week with the best background of any guest we've had yet is the excellent analyst on the NBC Sports Horse Racing Broadcast, Randy Moss. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, I'm, I'm honored to be joining you. I think I've watched every single one of these ones that you guys have done over the years. So it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure. And this background is out of necessity. Uh, Jerry Bailey and I just had to wait for Todd Fletcher, and we spent a while with him. So this was the, uh, this was the best, uh, best place to do it from. I'm glad it works. Can you, uh, can you clock some horses at the same time while you're talking to us and get multitasking? <laughs> It might be tough using the uh, the uh, the timer function on my iPhone and doing a Zoom at the same time, but I'll try. <laughs> All right. Well, we appreciate you making time. Uh, let's just start with this. Um, you have we've had the Derby PPs for a little under twenty four hours. What are your early thoughts on the Derby field? Do you respect the favorites? Are you going to try to get cute with some long shots? How do you feel? Yeah, I respect the favorite. I mean, because of his versatility and because you know, regardless of circumstances, fast pace, slow pace, inside, outside. Sloppy track, fast track, 
he almost always, you know, brings his A game. Uh, the vulnerability there, I think, is that his A game is only like about average and maybe even a little below average historically for a Kentucky Derby favorite. So looking at the field, I mean, all we've got to go on, obviously, is what we've seen in the past, uh, which is limited. But if any of these horses jumps up and surprises us by running an above average Kentucky Derby, they'll probably win and, and the central quality will probably get beat. Hey, Randy, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, once Life is Good came out of the Kentucky Derby field from a buyer speed figure standpoint, and uh, if people don't know, Randy's a big part of the buyer team as well, are, are pretty ordinary, I would say. I mean, a lot of horses in the 90s, et cetera. I don't know how that compares to other derbies, but I, you know, it's, it's popular for people to knock the crop. But is it appropriate this time? Is this a, a less than stellar derby group? Well, Obviously, all we have to go on right now, Bill, is what you just mentioned. I mean, you look at the speed figures, various different speed figures, not just the buyers that I'm involved with, but, you know, Jerry Browns and Ragazins and all that. And almost all of them have this crop, I think, a little below average coming in to the Kentucky Derby. But this is the most inexperienced Kentucky Derby field probably in the history of the race. I know going all the way back to 1906, which is as far back as the stats go. This Derby field has the lowest number of starts per horse ever, 5.3. So there's a lot of, obviously a lot of improvement that's baked into these horses probably because they're so lightly raced. The problem is we just don't know the upside. We don't know what these horses are capable of running and neither do their owners and their trainers and their riders. They're all guessing just like we are you know, what, what the top end is on, on all these horses. Right now, it looks like a below average bunch, mm -hmm. but obviously it wouldn't be shocking to see a couple of them really take that big step on Saturday. And Randy, we've been following this three-year-old crop, uh, you know, since the beginning of the year, watching all their races. And I think across the board, Joe, Bill, and I have, uh, you know, have, have thought that the biggest and best group of horses, you know, come from Louisiana and also we're coming from Arkansas, which is, you know, right, right in your neck of the woods. Um, and, and you have a great background uh, and history with, with Oaklawn. And then when the Derby entries came out, you know, really there was nobody other than, you know, other than Superstock, there was nobody coming in from Arkansas. They're all headed for the Preakness. Um, what's your feel on the group that was coming into the, the Triple Crown races, you know, whether it's Superstock or Cattle River or Concert Tour um, or, or somebody else that we missed? Is there, is there kind of a dark horse that, that may jump up, you know, later on in the uh, three-year-old campaigns? Um, from Arkansas, I, I don't know. I mean, I, concert tour was, was really disappointing, obviously in the Arkansas Derby. Uh, I think that what got him really, I think it was distance limitation. In my opinion, I, I, I think the difference between a soft paced rebel in which he controlled the pace and an aggressively paced Arkansas Derby, where he had to deal with Caddo river right from the start was kind of his undoing. And he had no punch for the final quarter mile. And Bob Baffert also said that he, he doesn't believe that the horse traveled that well. Um, so that's why he chose to bring him back to Churchill Downs instead of flying him back to California to get ready for the Preakness to avoid, you know, a little less travel from that standpoint. Um, Caddo River probably is not going to make the Preakness. Um, that's, that's, you know, I think that's kind of a long shot right now. So the horses from Arkansas, I don't think we're going to see too much of those, those horses down the road. Uh, Louisiana horses, I, I, you know, I concurred with you that from a numbers perspective, they looked really solid most of the spring. Uh, Mandaloon obviously laid an egg in the Louisiana Derby for reasons that nobody knows. We even talked to Florent Giroux back here on the backstretch about a half hour ago. And I said, look, off the record, totally off the record. Do you have any theory as to why Mandaloon ran like he did? And he said, zero. He said, I have absolutely no idea. Um, but yeah, I, to me, I, I don't really have a strong opinion about who the late developing horses that we might see um, coming down the line. I think maybe some of them are horses that have never even run into stakes race yet. Oh, Florent doesn't watch this show because this is all on the record, Randy, just so you know. Um, <laughs> so I, want, I wanted to ask about, about the, the broadcast that you guys do. You guys do an incredible job on the NBC broadcast. And I think you, you, you in particular do a really good job. 
not dumbing down racing for the general audience, but also, you know, not making it too complicated. So what, what are some of your strategies and the way you approach the broadcast so that you kind of straddle that middle ground where you're not insulting the, the hardcore horse players, but you're also not making it too confusing for the casual viewers? That's a hard line to straddle. And it's very nice of you to, to say what you did, because that's, that's one of my primary focuses is trying to figure out how to explain things in a way that the average person can say, oh, that makes sense, but you're not insulting the people that really are involved in this sport right from the beginning. And there are all kinds of different approaches to that that the networks take. I, when I was back with ESPN, one year we went to a big meeting in Bristol, Connecticut with all the big wigs at ESPN. And they said, all right, look, you got to make sure and not use too much inside jargon. You got to make sure these people understand exactly what you're talking about. The next year we went back for another big wig meeting and they said, look, use all the inside jargon you can use. <laughs> all of our marketing tells us that it makes people feel like that they're inside the sport, that they're learning something that they didn't know when you use inside jargon. And then a couple of years later, it was back to now dumb it down a little bit. Yeah, but yeah. I, I do feel that it's, it's better to try to find a middle ground there. Yeah. Randy, the pace of the Kentucky Derby, again, when uh, there was a horse that looked like he was definitely going to set the pace, Cato River, now is out. Looks to me about you got five or six horses that want to be third or second in the first call. But I don't see anyone who you can say, pinpoint, that horse is going to the lead. Who do you think will go to the lead, and do you think it will be a slow pace? Jerry and I both think Rock Your World is going to the lead, um, especially now with Cato River out. Uh, to me, from a pace figure perspective, those two horses stood out uh, when you were handicapping the Derby two weeks ago, a week ago. And now without Caddo River, you know, if he just runs his race back in the Santa Anita Derby, I think that puts Rock Your World on the lead. Um, I'll invoke Jerry again. I mean, he and I are like one in one a discussing all these things. He believes that the key to Rock Your World is for Joel Rosario to ride him on Saturday exactly the same way that John Velasquez rode authentic in the Kentucky Derby. From an outside post, gradually, slowly meet out his early speed in the run down the stretch the first time. Don't move your hands at all. Keep him nice and relaxed. And then right before you get to the first turn, open your hands up a little bit, give the horses cue, let him spurt to the early lead and clear the field and drop over. I think Medina Spirit is probably going to be the horse and we haven't had a chance to talk to Baffert yet about this, but I think Medina Spirit is going to be the one most likely to be closest to Rock Your World to force the pace. And then, as you said, a lot of other horses back there wanting to be in that position, you know, sit Hot Rod Charlie, Midnight Bourbon, even Mandaloon, sitting third, fourth, right behind the speed. But I don't think it's going to be an exceptionally fast pace. I think it'll be an honest pace, but not exceptionally fast. And Randy, yesterday was actually the post draw. And I know as an owner, you know, I was sitting there nervously waiting for our, our pill to be pulled to see where we were going to be. When you look at this field of 20, do you think so-and-so got a better draw and that's going to help its case or so-and-so got a terrible draw and that's really going to be a problem for that horse? John, you probably never heard me say this because ESPN and NBC wouldn't let me say it when we televised the draw live. In my opinion, the post position draw is the single most overrated part of Kentucky Derby week. I really do. Um, for example, you see all the hand wringing all week about owners that don't want the number one post position as if there's a pit of quicksand right in front of, of stall number one when they leave the gate. But yet, if you look at the odds rankings each year for the horses that draw the number one post, on average, they outrun their odds. Uh, it's like people think that, you know, geometry suddenly goes out the window when it comes to Kentucky Derby time. Hell, it's why Calvin Burrell won three Kentucky Derbies, because he's the, the, the inside post. And yet you hear people say, OK, the inside post, the rail hasn't won since Ferdinand in 1986. OK, known agenda buried down on the rail. Oh, my God, what a bad post. Essential quality got the 14 hole. Fabulous draw. It's a perfect draw for essential quality. Hey. No horse has won from post 14 since carry back in 1961. How come nobody's talking about that? What looks like might be a perfect post can be a terrible post if the horses around you decide to make it a terrible post and vice versa. It's just kind of the luck of the draw. And I don't think you can really tell until the gates open. I was, I was getting all the quotes from the trainers too, because other than like one or two, it's all going to be some form of it's fine. So you got like 20 quotes. Yeah. Of trainers going, it's fine. Um, but so one more question for me, uh, 
one of the things that that I, I respect about you is, is your figure making prowess. Uh, you have you had the Moss Pace figures that I thought really kind of changed the way people looked at the racing form. Since then, Time Form US has got on that bandwagon as well. What do you think the state of uh, of data is in racing in terms of innovation, in terms of accessibility? What do you th- what kind of strides do you think we've made, and, and what needs still needs to be done? Yeah, hopefully we're beginning what I think could be uh, a really important era uh, technology-wise for horse players. If we can get the uh, things like the, the, the GMAX GPS technology, tracking technology that Equibase is trying to perfect right now, it's obviously had its problems. Uh, if, if Trackus can take the next step forward, for example, if we can get to the point where we can very accurately say, and the technology is there to do this, You know, horse A traveled X number of feet during the running of this race. That can make a world of difference in all the various different, you know, speed figure and 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 pace figure computations. And that's like the first step, um, I think, to really getting to that next level. But I think I think it's on its way. I really do. So, Randy, after you said post positions don't matter, I'm going to ask you a post position question. (laughs) <laughs> um, the, the one thing that probably did matter most over the years, of course, is the one post. And I know some people have thought, oh, my goodness, no agenda, quality horse drew the one. What do you hear or what have you surmised on your own about how much better the post would be now that they have the new gate versus the old gate? Uh, Bill, all the trainers are talking about it, uh, especially Todd Pletcher, uh, who's got the number one post with known agenda. Uh, he's actually had a talk with the uh, with the starter here, Churchill Downs, who's told him, that there's a 15 foot difference between the old uh, two starting gate system and the one starting gate system, meaning that in the old days when horses broke from post number one with two gates side by side in the derby, they were looking straight down the racetrack at the rail that like the rail was directly in front of them and they had to navigate to the right to try to get around the rail as it turned from the, uh, from the home stretch into the main stretch. Now with the new starting gate, and they're even going to move it out a little further than 15 feet. It's a complete straight shot looking down the stretch, and jockeys no longer have to worry about that. You know, horsemen, starter, think it's going to be, you know, think it's going to make a huge difference. You know, I didn't have a problem with the number one post position to begin with. Uh, like I said, it's why Calvin Burrell's in the Hall of Fame. So uh, riding the rail. But, yeah, I, I think the starting gate is a, is a big step. Mm-hmm. And Randy, one more question, but it has nothing to do with horse racing. It has to do with your other love, which is NFL football. Um, aside from the fact we have some big races coming up this weekend at Churchill, there's also a little thing known as the NFL draft coming up this week. Um, I know I'm not going to ask you to pick between your children as far as which you like better, but as far as the NFL draft goes, is there a player that, you're, that you've been watching over the past couple of years where you say that he's going to be a bona fide star? Yeah, Kyle Pitts, the tight end from Florida is uh, just an amazing talent, almost a transformational talent at the tight end position. He's not much of a blocker, but when it it comes to uh, all the other skill sets that he has, uh, he's going to be a phenomenal addition to any team that drafts him and probably an instantaneous pro bowler in his rookie year. We're all quarterback centric looking at the NFL draft, obviously, nowadays, I think. And so does Mike Tirico. He just said the same thing to me, that Kyle Pitts is probably going to be the number one non-quarterback selected in the draft. Uh, and when, you, and when you're talking about ranking my loves between horse racing and NFL, uh, horse racing obviously is, uh, is, is a clear number one. I'm not much of a draft guy to begin with. Uh, I love NFL, not particularly draft week. So I'm, I'm glad I'm here. Well, it's close as it's close as we're going to get to football for a while. So, so I'll be watching. Um, but Randy, thank you so much for the time. Are you on this? Are you on a selfie stick right now? No, my arm is getting tired. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> for Mark and Betty, I thought you had a selfie stick, and even then, I was going to compliment you. But Randy, thanks. Thank you so much for the time. Enjoy Derby Week and continue the great work on the broadcast. Yeah, you guys keep up the good work too. Take care. Thanks, thanks Randy. Thanks, Randy. Excellent. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Randy Moss, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. 
The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust The Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit The Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. So before we get out of here this week, I wanted to reflect a little bit on last week's show. Went down to Ocala, did the live show from the OBS sales ground. It's gotten a lot of great feedback. We appreciate everybody who's who's watching and, and, and writing in and, and supporting us because it took a lot of work. You know, I, I had to fly on a private plane down there and they only had like chips and pretzels. They didn't have like the gourmet meal I was expecting. So it was a little, little disappointing, um, but just kidding. John, John and Len treated me very well down there. I had a great time learning about the sales game. Um, so that was like, that was my first sale. So I, I, had, I had a couple of, of reactions. First of all, the main thing, and I wrote about this in the story about the podcast last week is the main thing that, that I took away was just how happy everybody was to have things be back to normal and to have, you know, a full parking lot where everybody's feeling optimistic and hopeful about the future. Horses were selling well, consigners were doing well. It was just, you know, as someone who hadn't been there last year, I could only imagine what it was like last year compared to this year. And it was just, it was a real, it was a real fun, joyous atmosphere. And I, I really, you know, could appreciate that. And, you know, I thought the, the interviews that we did were, were great. I thought all four guys were really good and had a lot of, a lot of insights. I think, I think consigners in general are pretty down to earth guys who have a good sense of humor because it's the kind of business where things can go south or go great in a hurry. So you kind of have to have a little bit of good humor. Um, I, I thank them on the, on the show, but I want to thank Patty and the crew for coming down there as well. They did a great job. Um, and the show looked great. You know, it's it just from an aesthetic standpoint, it looked amazing. The, the crystal the picture was crystal clear. And I loved having in the background, the horses and the people around. So we're really proud of that. And then we we're glad that, that, people really enjoyed that as well and hopefully like i said it's a little bit of a test run for some future live shows and maybe we can get bill um out there next time for whenever we do that but there was one story i wanted to tell before i i uh, I, I finished reflecting on this so um remember what i said last week at the beginning where i said i'm joe bianca blah 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 one thing i've learned this week is not to accidentally raise your hand or scratch your head or anything and bid on a horse no less than 30 minutes later i did that Right after saying that, I did that. So I was in the sales. I was in. I was in the the at the sale with John Len and Mark Cassie, and a horse came into the ring, Medallia Doro, out of Tin Type Gal. And Mark Cassie turns to me and says, "This horse is going to go for a lot." And as as she starts, as the bidding, as the numbers start to go up, I turn to Mark and I'm like, like a rocket, like she's going up like a rocket. And the guy takes my bid, and I didn't realize it until he came back to me. He came back to me at, at I bid six hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> and he came back to me at like six twenty five and was like, and I was like, no, 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 no. Um, so that was that that was pretty ironic. And I, you know, if I had won the horse, I would have just put it on the TDN card. So I don't think it would have been that big of a deal. Um, but <laughs> thankfully, I got outbid, and the horse was actually an RNA. The horse went up to seven hundred twenty-five thousand. Was an RNA. So either way, I think I was in the clear there. But it was just funny that I I broke my own rule twenty minutes later, and not on a horse that cost ten thousand dollars on a six hundred thousand dollar horse. So. Mark and John and Len got a kick out of that. They literally told every single person we ran into the rest of the, the way, like, watch out for this guy. He's been $600,000 on horses. Um, but apparently I didn't learn my own lesson, John. No, and, and and the funniest part of the story, actually twofold. One was that, um, was that uh, you know, they ran you up. I mean, they saw Joe Bianca bidding on horses and they were like, hey, we got a live one. Let's keep bidding. And that's why the horse was an RNA for seven twenty five, which was which was pretty funny. The second thing is I can only imagine if the hammer went down at six hundred thousand, not only would you have sprinted out of there, you would have beaten um, Chubb Wagon and or Gamine for six furlongs, you, we never would have seen you again. It would have been like a puff of smoke and, and a shadow of where Joe Bianca was and maybe a puddle on the seat of where Joe Bianca was. <laughs> Definitely. I was, I was telling Megan about it and I was like, I accidentally bid 600,000 on a horse and she goes, what the hell? Like there must be a take back, take back option. I was like, the take back option is me disappearing into a vapor cloud. <laughs> That's the, that was the only other option for me at that point if the hammer had dropped. So thankfully it didn't, but now I have a horse to root for. 
Medallia Doro, a 10 type gal, it's a Colt. Um, so, you know, maybe we can get a matchup between him and Writer's Room somewhere down the line, and then I'll, I'll, I'll really have my allegiances torn. Um, but yeah, it was a great time at OBS. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of hospitality from everybody we ran into, and everybody was in a good mood. So, thankfully, I didn't come home with a $600,000 horse. And everything else was was good enough and successful enough that I think we're going to do some more live shows in the future. So with Bill, because Bill, you would be yeah. we missed. We we missed you on, on, on that. Did show. you guys really miss me? No, but for the show, <laughs> we'll say we did. No, we did. Listen, it, it had a different energy because as much as we love doing the show on the Zoom, uh, you know, format and everything like that, yeah. it, it definitely was different. You know, being there, uh, being live, being able to interview people, and and you know, I'm I'm a I'm a you know writer wannabe. So the opportunity for me to like ask questions to people, um, you know, like you guys do for a living, was was really fun for for me. But we had an extra chair there that that was that sat empty. Um, you know, with, with, uh, with an empty moniker as well, because you don't have a title yet. Um, uh, but, uh, but we definitely missed you and we look forward to having you at the next live show. Um, right. hopefully at Saratoga. And if not, we'll hang on, we'll hang a Red Sox shirt on the empty chair and it'll be like, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Patty Wolf and their crew did a great job with the banner, with the chairs. Absolutely. That was a real set, baby. That was a that was a real radio row type set. So it's right, so one last last thing before we get out of here um, this week. We're gonna do a little giveaway. We're gonna do the first ever TDN Writers Room giveaway. John somehow did not find enough people to take all of his Gilliam shirts. He bought like several hundred of them, I think. I have several. Bill's got several. Um, so we're gonna do a little contest, and they're nice shirts. Like it's a really great logo. Uh, it was designed by John's wife, Michelle. Um, she did a great job and uh, you can't see the back, but there, yeah, John, show them the back. Yeah. So it's, it's like that kind of molecular diagram, very cool in the colors of DJ stable. So we're going to give away five of these exclusive helium t-shirts. If you can give Bill Finley a proper title every week on this show, he comes on and he still doesn't have a title and he laments that fact. And we have to keep filling things in at the bottom and it's getting exhausting. Honestly, our, our editing crew is, is complaining about having to keep coming up with titles for him. So email us, email us. You can email me at joebianca at gmail.com. You can email Sue, Sue Finley at the tdn.com. Give us your best title for Bill Finley to wear on this show. And we will send you a helium shirt. Best of luck. All right. So that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. A reminder that entries are open for the Keeneland May digital sale until May 18th. Go to KeenelandDigital.com for details. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, Randy Moss, our producer, Patty Wolf, and our editors, Danny Seiper, Aliyah LaRocca, and Anthony LaRocca. Thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the Derby and send in those ideas for Bill's title. He might send you a shirt. See you next week. Bye.